September, as recent as uh, September 3rd, I believe he said, was 70%. We put out on the table, just as a challenge for all of you, to, as you're collecting, the LDL of less than 100 at 55.7. You'll see that's a bit dated. It has not been run recently, so it was June of this calendar year. And then um, for the diabetics, it was a compliance of 39.8. It's a challenging group. Uh, one of the things that I want to mention is that we have a program that the physicians of the uh, medical group can refer to, that actually James um, Palmer is responsible for, that allows us to have a little targeted focus for those secondary intervention patients, including those individuals with diabetes. And out of that population of patients, we do uh, run 70% compliance of achieving um, an LDL of less than 7 so it does take a lot of extra effort, but having pharmacists and nurses involved in this uh, program called HeartSmart helps decompress the physician's practice a bit, because as your challenge is how do they do all of this in the cardiology and the primary care. We certainly don't see all the lipid management and hypertension management being done in cardiology. Much of it's being done in primary care. So having alternatives to be able to help them be able to focus on the, the key ingredients for those um, visits and having the ancillary staff to help support them, we think has really made a, a difference in that compliance. And we've kind of put that out as a challenge uh, for all our health systems to have equal kinds of programs in play. But tell us about them. I think that's what Dr. Ignahotri and, and what we're really about in this forum is a safe place to be able to talk about our data and learn from each other to really change the community standard of care. Because that's what we're, we're really excited about. So that's all I have for today. Are there any questions? Okay. I just had one quick question. So you said that there's a different program in the hospitals for your diabetics with heart disease. Well, what we do is, um, and James, you can add that live as well, but what we do is we uh, promote to our, um, our physicians, primary care and cardiology, with the, the medical group, Spoken Hill physicians, as well as the Mercy Health group, a program that they can refer um, their patients to to really ma aggressively manage the lipids. Because we find the biggest challenge is the patients, particularly if they're not following the lifestyle uh, recommendations, they don't come back to you guys. They Or they cancel those appointments, or we have the ability to harass them a bit, make out phone calls, follow up on them, get them to the, the lab and get those results, and then have those conversations with dietitians, um, uh, pharmacists, and nurses. So that's really that subset. But we do um, treat um, diabetes as uh, a more aggressively without any evidence of um, you know, having a secondary advantage. Okay, okay thank you, Joyce. Thank yeah. you very much. So uh, I want to bring Chante up. Uh, Chante Williams. Uh, sure. Who's okay, okay. I just have a few things. Okay, all here. right. Good. Have a lot of here. Um, so federal initiatives um, really treat cardiac health as one of their priorities right now. So Measuring your uh, hypertensive patients and your cardiac health helps you meet many incentive programs, as well as helps you prevent the stick that's coming down. <coughs> um, for meaningful use, you need to um, monitor blood pressure as part of both the core measures as well as the clinical quality measures. For PKRS, for you guys who receive that incentive, you have to be and start measuring your cardiac patients as well, as well as the Million Hearts campaign. So. Um, my organization, Health Services Advisory Group, is the Medicare QIO for California, so we help primary care providers capture this data within their EHR or within their claims, and there are specific ways you need to capture it for the different incentive programs. So if you have any questions or maybe any assistance with doing that, my information is in the uh, attendee list, and feel free to email me at any time.
blood pressure, lipid and blood sugar control. So, so that's a big financial incentive. Very important for all of us in the medical groups and health plans. So thank you. Thank you, Shanti. Uh, so in the remaining just a few minutes, uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Villablanca has uh, provided the, these questions and I think what we wanted to do instead of break out is to actually just uh, attack them as a group because uh, these are key questions for all of us and we're going to come back and report uh, them. So uh, since our time is short, uh, we'd like to start out with the question number one, what should be the priority for addressing barriers to guideline implementation? And we want to get your thoughts and see if anybody has any specific thoughts uh, on this uh, because uh, 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 this is a real challenge for all of us. My suggestion at the outset would be to identify the barriers and allocate them to our various uh, entertain to the physician or the patient's medical home or to the patient himself. And then maybe by breaking the button Anyone else? Actually, we have a, a, a concern with health and state health programs. We have IPAs and we have our doctors are all over the region, and so I think education about what the guidelines are at all levels of the staff to the providers are really, very really important, and also what a guideline means um, both to the community and to the provider. I think it's education to the providers and finding a way to reach out to the tribes through the plants or through the organized uh, health organizations. Because Kaiser is all comprehensive. So you've got the hospital, you've got the clinics, you've got the tribes, but you have other, other organizations that are really working with a lot of different cultures and different tribes. Yeah, I, I think we ran across this from the, the diabetes side many years ago that one of the key issues was getting those guidelines to the right people your primary care providers and number one having them you know kind of open up uh, the mail was the other key piece you could get the, the information but getting people to open it up and look at it with them. so we've got to think about how do we do that more effectively uh, to the to our, our, our primary care providers in particular any other thoughts on um Thank you. 
So, so it, <coughs> it's critical for us to make sure we define who really should be targeted to get the, this information, because it's not just MDs and DOs, uh, but other uh, pro uh, providers who are uh, you know, accessing patients uh, on a, on a kind of first-line basis. So that's a key recommendation. To broaden the scope of information dissemination even more, I would suggest there may be a value in providing this information to employers that are large enough to be able to afford some on the HR uh, to look over their shoulders and see what value they're getting for the money that they're investing in health care. Historically, the HR people I've talked to about that have been very motivated to make sure they're getting a decent return on their investment. Now, that may not be the question of interest. Uh, because the last thing the world clinicians may want is pressure from payers. Uh, but it may be a way of achieving some pressure on clinicians and some positive pressure also in the world piece in terms of adherence to healthy lifestyle. Which <coughs> probably brings us to uh, question number three, which strategies can, uh, and uh, question two as well, could optimize implementation of guidelines. Because if uh, employers, like for example, <coughs> PBGH, <coughs> excuse me, um, get this information and actually could focus on identifying or prioritizing cardiovascular disease in women uh, in particular and, uh, and then creating some strategies around, you know, first of all, uh, making them part of quality measurements, you might be able to get more uh, uptake and particularly if some of those quality measures are put into a paper performance type of what about using continuing education uh, as one of the mechanisms for getting the information out? Do, do each of you think that that would be effective, Dr. Koldinger? Do you think that might help your medical group? Uh, I'm sorry, by what method? Using continuing medical education? Well, sure. Uh, I, yeah, I'm kind of struggling with this uh, because uh, it should be, should be hard. Thank you. 
they're individuals, but they're, they're just factors that we're not aware of sometimes. And they play in many, many realms. Um, and this may be an area where that's important too. So we have started to put in a little bit more in our work on on Yeah, I think this is great for the people that, 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 that come and show up. Uh, I think what we need to do is to also start thinking about those people who, you know, are, don't come to these meetings and who are the decision makers for the particular women who are at high risk that we've heard today. And so, uh, I think that's going to be a, a key issue and a challenge for this group to to fuse this information out there to the to the decision makers uh, such that we can get to, and I thought Carol's point was a good one, is, you know, this is a lot of information and how do you apply it uh, when you only have, you know, a 15 minute visit and, and how do you do that effectively and keep it on the table so that it doesn't sort of fall off and you're able to reach it, you know, not just about a one-time intervention with a patient, but it's about, uh, you know, uh, creating a process so I, we're at, at our time. I wish you know we had a, a little bit more time. We could discuss this uh, for hours and hours, and it's a big challenge. And I know all of you are very busy and have uh, uh, a whole bunch of emails and telephone calls to pick up. So thank you again. And uh, we're uh, gonna, by the way, next month uh, we're not going to be here uh, because of the the uh, statewide meeting. And in November, wanted to remind you, we'll be meeting uh, a couple of blocks away. At, uh, uh, off uh, Del Paso, we'll give you the information. It's going to be Sutter Health University. Uh, we'll be uh, sponsoring because it turns out this venue is not going to be available because of uh, Veterans Day. Uh, but uh, we'll send you the information and we hope you can make it and uh, bring your colleagues. Thank you very much and have a good uh, trip back uh, to your place of business. <laughs>
you got the medicine. And I should know the calls. And you know, the thing is that, unlike, you know, what you can see in that new bed, you know, these are two that much more calls. I'm not actually doing this straight. You have that new bed first. You have to back up. You have to back up. You have to back up. So, as you can see, five years old, they are already diagnosed with heart disease. I mean, I think there's a lot of, a lot of easy 
stuff happening here, and this is why I feel like this is really not actually even. So we're getting to an even level. We're starting to feel like we're in trouble. What are we going to do? Well, you actually were. Yeah, we're going to accomplish all this stuff. Yeah. How long does it take to drop from the center of the day? Two and a half, two hours. Some of the things that we're doing is we're going to try to send them with the art movies. We might even have a show that's more. We might have a show that's more. You're fine. Put some numbers to it. Right. And you're in real trouble once you get to half the Exactly. Yeah. Um, that's that's like, yeah, take care. Yeah, that's the that are happening because of excess events um, uh, related to the uncontrolled blood pressure, related to the LDL. And then do some economic analysis to say, you know what, this lack of treatment for these patients is a federal and state have of these dollars. It's very, very significant. Right. And some of that you know, has to do I know that when, when, when we were revising the mm -hmm. um, one of the viewers wanted to know what the cost of the program was. So DHHS was going to come up with and what they did is they basically took the grant dollars, how much they Thank you. 
Yeah, no, I, 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 I